So are you holding us here till it's our turn? Till everyone gets here and everyone's comfortable with the platform and whatnot. But welcome. Thank you. So are, is there another session going on right now? Yeah, uh, well, we'll have two more starting at five actually. Um, we, we've been we've been trying to do about three at a time. So, I mean, if there's any that you want to see that you're going to be presenting during, they'll be all, all uploaded to YouTube at a later date. But okay. yeah, there should be two others starting pretty soon. Okay. I miss attending this conference in person. Yeah, we sort of, well, I think we had to make the decision in about August, really just working with the university. And I mean, at that point, the Delta variant was starting to pick up a little bit. So we were a little bit uncertain. I think the board board pretty much unanimously voted to host it virtually again, but knock on wood next year, we'll yeah. be back in Eugene. <laughs> Well, if it, if it gives you any comfort, all of the conferences I'm doing through March, everyone decided to go online. Yeah. April is when people started feeling like, okay, maybe we can pull off in person. So, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it to networking with people in person and saying hi. Well, and plus, this conference is the absolute best place to pick up weird bumper stickers. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, all the the groups that come out that have their bumper stickers. So I think oh. my favorite over the years was practice human extinction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll see lots of funky bumper stickers all over Eugene and there's lots of niche environmental groups in and around. So yeah, I, got, I, I didn't think it'd be a good place to pick up upper stickers, but when I come back next year, I'll have to <laughs> have to get one for my old car. <laughs> Sorry, I just got new glasses and one of them is for just for computers and i'm trying to see if it actually is better but it is that's good i'm, I'm glad I, i'm glad it's working as intended <laughs> so you're a 1l i'm actually a 2l oh, okay um, yeah oh there's cole cole's gonna be moderating the panel i'm just acting as tech support okay um yeah cole's a 1l um actually no oh. That I am. How are you guys doing? Good. Have you been in person this year? Yeah. 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 We've been uh, all in person except for um, I have one online class this semester. Um, but yeah, it's been a nice change of pace. Just going to fix my lighting here real quick. Yeah. Is that property that you have in or over virtually? Yeah. Yeah, I guess if Professor Wood had been teaching it this semester, it probably would have been in person, but she's got lots of things going on now. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Sarah. Yeah, I uh, I really like the adjunct professor that we have, um, O'Neill. Yeah, yeah, she had a pretty impressive CV from what I could tell. So I'm glad yeah. I'm glad it's going well. Yeah. Um, Robin. Yeah. Did, did, am I? Did you interpret our email exchange as hope goes second, I go third? Was she wanting to be? 
I interpreted it as you were both content for me to go first, but as between <laughs> two and three, um, I, 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 I was un unclear what Hope had in mind, but second sounded good, so. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine either way, but I, I'm going to uh, cover more of Oregon, so maybe I was thinking it might fit nicely at the end. Okay. I, I mentioned Oregon a couple of places, but just briefly. I saw that. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that early. I would share mine, except I'm literally still working on it. Um, okay. I'm giving three presentations this week, one next week, and organizing and moderating a conference next week. So. Okay. I've got um, my. This is my second this week, and then I've got another one tomorrow, and then Monday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, next week, and then the following Friday. So yeah, it March well, is the season, and now, and because it's all on Zoom, it's like you can't say, "Well, sorry, I'm going to be in the air," you know, or "I'm going to be on a plane during that one." So. I don't that. know. I, I've not been presenting from planes. Um, <laughs> no, well, that's what I mean. It used to be when you were in person, oh, you know, it's if, if one was on Thursday and one was on Friday, you were going to be on a plane for one of them. So, right, right. You couldn't, couldn't do the back to backs. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, I'm looking forward to it. And I always like to say yes to these pilk events. Yes. Well, I was lamenting the uh, lack of weird bumper stickers that you, <laughs> you can, that you can collect when this conference is in person. So, yes. Yeah, we appreciate your guys' acceptances. <laughs> <laughs> the more speakers are always welcome. There we go. There's a picture of my son recreating. <laughs> Cool. on some coastal land all right it looks like we're just waiting on hope mm -hmm. i guess we'll give it a few minutes and if I mean, since you're going first, Robin, worst case scenario, if she joins a little bit late, we'll just have her go after after introductions and whatnot. But you should be here in a few. You might want to email her. We were we were going back and forth on the time slot a little bit, so. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the timing, um, does this panel end at a uh, quarter after the next, after the hour or a half hour? Uh, we've got it at a quarter after, but I don't think there's anything right afterwards. So if we go a little bit over, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to keep working on my PowerPoint to be nice. <laughs> it's close, people. It's close. I could go with it as it is, but that's not how I roll. So is anyone viewing these synchronously or is it all no. recorded? Yeah, okay. We've had about like 30 to 50 people on average, depending on the panel. It's a little bit odd because it's a Thursday, but um, yeah, there's definitely been some some viewership synchronously. So if you did, there should be some Q&A. Okay. And I checked, I can share my screen okay, it looks like, so. Perfect.
if you guys want, we can get started because my uh, my intro is kind of long um, with all the land acknowledgements and stuff. Um, um, so that should give, I don't know, maybe a few minutes for well, Hope have, to... Have you emailed Hope? No, I haven't. Okay, I'm, I'm going to send. I, I've got it. I've got it. I, uh, I'll send a reminder right now. Okay. And then I'll get it started and then we'll, we'll, we'll start on it. Sounds good. All right, I uh, will go ahead and start the webinar and start letting attendees in. All right, everyone. Thank you for coming to the panel. It looks like everyone's trickling in. Um, I am Cole Barron. I am the webmaster's apprentice for Land Air Water, and I will be moderating this panel. Uh, thank you for attending the Public Trust Doctrine and Recreation panel. Um, I have just a few announcements before we will get started with the panel. So for a quick tech warning, don't worry if you can't see yourself. This is a Zoom webinar, so all the attendees are automatically muted with videos off, so you will only be able to see the panelists. Throughout the panel, if you have a, a question, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. All of our panelists will be, given, will be giving their presentations, and then there will be a 15-minute uh, Q&A session at the end where the panelists will answer your questions. Please remember to be courteous of all viewpoints throughout the presentation and Q&A session. Additionally, if there are any legal professionals in the audience wanting to earn CLE credit for this panel, I will put a link to register and pay on JotForm. If you haven't registered, please do so. Um, also, our alumni board, Friends of, Friends of Land or Water, helps to provide stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. Um, if you are interested in making a donation to help provide students with those stipends, information to do so will be on a Google document, which we will put into the link, but we will put the link into the chat. Mm -hmm. Lastly, we would like to say a brief land acknowledgement, uh, and forgive me if I mis mispronounce anything. Um, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya, Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional, uh, traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and Confederated Tribes of Sillets Indi Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. Pilk would like to acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya people in the uh, Willamette Valley and express our respect for the tribal nations of Oregon. We will now introduce our panelists. Sarah Adams Shane is a faculty member of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center. Her scholarship, applied research and service focus on climate change and law and policy 
state and local government law and land use, focusing on climate resilience in the coastal and inland floodplains and wildland urban inter interface. She begins to her, she brings her, excuse me, she brings her to her teaching a love of the theory and practice of law, grounded in more than a decade of law practice experience. Prior to embarking on her legal career, she received a master's in economics at the London School of Economics and worked as a senior policy analyst for Portland, Oregon's uh, Metro Regional Government. She received her JD from Lewis and Clark Law School. Moving on to Hope Babcock, who is not with us currently, but hopefully she will be joining us soon. Professor Babcock served as general counsel to the National Audubon Society from 1987 to 1991, and as deputy general counsel and director of Audubon's public lands and water program from 1981 to 87. Previously, she was a partner with Blum, Nash, and Railsback, where she focused on energy and environmental issues and an associate at LaBeouf, Lamb, Levy, and McRae, where she represented utilities in the nuclear licensing process. From 1977 to 79, she served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Energy and Minerals in the U.S. Department of the Interior. Professor Badcock has taught environmental law and natural resource law as a visiting professor at Pace University Law School and as an adjunct at the University of Pennsylvania, Yale, Catholic University, and Antioch Law Schools. Professor Babcock was a member of the Standing Committee on Environmental Law of the American Bar Association and served on the Clinton-Gore transition team. Finally, we have Robin Craig, and she specializes in all things water, including the relationships between climate change and water, the water energy food nexus, the Clean Air Act, the intersection of water issues and land issues, ocean and coastal law, marine biodiversity and marine protected areas, water law, ecological resilience and the law, climate change adaptation, and the relationships between environmental law and public health. She is the author, co-author, uh, or editor of 12 books, including Re-Envisioning the Anthropocene Ocean, um, as well as textbooks for environmental law, water law, and toxic torts. She has also written more than 100 law reviews uh, law, sorry, excuse me, 100 law review articles and book chapters in both legal and scientific publications. Thank you to each of our panelists for being here and let's get started. All right, thank you, Cole. Uh, I am joining you from the ancestral lands of the Tongva, uh, more popularly known as Los Angeles these days, but the Tongva remain the guardians of this land. So I will be kicking us off with a discussion of how recreation came to be part of the public trust doctrine to begin with. Uh, and hopefully, yes, there we go. So how did uh, recreation become part of the public trust doctrine? Uh, I am joining you from USC, uh, but in the United States, we trace the public trust doctrine back to Rome, ancient Rome and the Institutes of Justinian. There's been some recent scholarship that supports this link, uh, but in the courts, uh, they picked up on the fact that the Institutes of Justinian said that rivers and ports are public and hence the right of fishing in a port or in rivers are in common. Uh, the basic idea of this public trust is that some amenities like waterways are too important to society as a whole to be put in purely private ownership. That then passed through England before it got to the United States. Uh, and in England, the public part of the public trust doctrine was the right of the crown to control navigation and fishing for big fish. Uh, nor, notably sturgeon in the various rivers in England. And so under the Magna Carta, the crown could remove all fish weirs from the Thames, the Medway and all other rivers in England to keep them open uh, for public use. This set up a potential dichotomy in the United States after the Revolutionary War uh, this is one of the, the times in water law when the fact that we had 13 independent states before we had a federal government 
actually matters to how the law developed. Uh, and so we had the 13 original colonies and then states who directly inherited the rights of the crown. Uh, that included the public trust doctrine and the crown's prerogative in navigable waters. Uh, and the states never gave that to the federal government. So it remains primarily a state prerogative uh, to this day, uh, which has a lot to do with how recreation came to be part of the public trust doctrine. So the classic United States public trust doctrine starts with state ownership of the beds and banks of navigable waters. Uh, this is a question of federal law. Uh, it is a penumbral part of the US Constitution through the equal footing doctrine. Uh, and the Supreme Court has made clear first that states own the beds and banks of all tidally influenced waters. So in coastal states like Oregon and California, that's an important part of state ownership and control. But more importantly, states own the beds and banks of all waters that were navigable in fact, meaning used or susceptible of being used in their ordinary condition as highways for commerce over which trade and travel may be conducted in the customary modes of trade and, uh, and travel on water at the time of statehood. So the state title test is very much tied to history and what waters were being used for at the time of statehood. So an example in Oregon is the Rogue River, uh, which an early Supreme Court case uh, just mentioned kind of in passing was not navigable, but Oregon uh, argued, oh yes it is, and eventually established state title to uh, an 89 mile stretch of the Rogue River. Uh, obviously, uh, recreational boats go up and down it, and that was one of Oregon's big motivations for pursuing state title to the Rogue River. The public trust doctrine, like I said, grows out of that state ownership of beds and banks of navigable waters. And uh, the Sup uh, Supreme Court has weighed in a few times on the public trust doctrine, most notably in 1892 in a case called Illinois Central Railroad versus Illinois. Uh, in this case, Illinois, uh, the Illinois legislature uh, in 1869, gave away a large tract of the Chicago Harbor uh, to the Illinois Central Railroad Company. About a thousand acres, a pretty big chunk of submerged lands, uh, with the idea that the railroad company would develop it for commerce, trade, railroad, connect railroads, and water traffic uh, on the Great Lakes. But four years later, uh, Illinois changed its mind and wanted the land back. And so uh, when it did so, it, it raised a question that made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, is that grant of these quote unquote sovereign submerged lands revocable or was it even legal in the first place? And what the Supreme Court pronounced was that when the states take title to these sovereign submerged lands, they do so in trust for the public as a whole and to protect in particular the three primary public trust uses, navigation, commerce, and fishing. Moreover, the states cannot alienate completely those sovereign submerged lands because of that public trust, except very small parcels that might be used in ways that aid the public's use of the navigable water, such as to build a dock or a wharf. Uh, and so the Supreme Court agreed with the state of Illinois that this grant was revocable, uh, probably not legal in the first place, and the state of Illinois could take control over those submerged lands once again. So what do we have as, a, uh, as the apparent public trust doctrine after Illinois Central? Uh, the lands under navigable waters are held in trust, it, held by the state in trust for the public specifically to protect navigation, commerce, and fishing. Uh, because of this public trust, states are limited in their abilities to completely alienate those titles to the sovereign submerged lands. But you notice uh, recreation is not one of those 
prime three uses. And so the question still remains, how did we get recreation into the public trust doctrine? Now, part of that issue is what was the source of law in Illinois Central? Uh, for those of you who have read Illinois Central, the Supreme Court is remarkably cagey about what exactly it's relying on uh, for its public trust authority. And this has been debated. Uh, it is debatable. Uh, many states assumed that the case was decided on a federal law basis of some sort, either maybe constitutional, like the equal footing doctrine itself, maybe federal common law. There are suggestions of that in Illinois Central itself, and state courts and state legislatures widely interpreted, interpreted the case to be based on federal law. But the U.S. Supreme Court itself since 1892 has emphasized repeatedly that the public trust doctrine itself is a matter of state law. So 1926, uh, in a case called Appleby versus City of New York, uh, involving the legality of filling in the Hudson River, which is clearly a navigable water, uh, and the conveyance of title into private hands of that river, uh, the court said, hey, that's a matter of New York state law. Illinois Central was a statement of Illinois state law. So this is up to the states what they decide to do with their sovereign submerged lands. Uh, a few years later, uh, actually several decades later, 1997, Idaho versus Coeur d'Alene tribe. Uh, again, the court reemphasized that the public trust doctrine itself is based on state law, uh, but it also suggested that the Illinois Central decision had a national character. So maybe we can think of it as a common law default. Most recently in 2012 in PPL Montana versus Montana, the Supreme Court at the very end of that decision, which actually was about Montana's title to the beds and banks of certain rivers, uh, at the very end of that decision, the court emphasized again that the contours of the public trust doctrine are a matter of state law. So it is up to states how broad or narrow they want their public trust doctrines to be. So uh, how do we get to recreation? There's a couple of paths that states have taken given that grant of authority from the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to bring in recreation. So one way is to expand the state definition of navigable waters that are subject to the public trust. So again, our basic rule, the public trust doctrine applies to the waterways for which the state acquired ownership of the submerged lands under that federal test. But states can define their own navigable waters for purposes of the public trust doctrine and states have done so. Many states have come up with their own state law definitions of which waters are public, uh, even if the submerged lands are privately owned. Uh, the second way to do this, especially in the West, is to say that uh, because the state owns all the water in the state, in prior appropriation states, you can almost always find a, a comment to that effect in either the state constitution or a state statute. The state owns the water, therefore the public trust doctrine applies to all waters. So one example, Oregon adopted a log flotation test very early in the 19th century uh, to support commerce in the timber industry. Uh, Arkansas, 1980, one of the later examples, the Supreme Court of Arkansas very uh, clearly decided that it was going to modify the state navigability test so that waters that were navigable for recreation would be included. My favorite example is Alaska. Alaska has a very broad statutory definition of navigable waters uh, subject to the state public trust doctrine. It includes explicitly recreation, fishing, hunting, uh, and anything where you can land a seaplane and any place that salmon go. So it's a very broad definition uh, serving the purposes that Alaska needed it to serve. 
Second path to getting to recreation or making recreation part of the public trust doctrine was to just expand the public uses protected. So not to change the waters so much, but just change the uses that uh, are protected for the public in the waters that are traditionally navigable waters. Again, that big three, navigation, fishing, and commerce. Most states uh, that have expanded their public trust doctrines have expanded recreational use on at least some waters within the state. And at this point, uh, way more than half the states have explicitly extended the public uses that are protected uh, to recreation. So second pathway there. One example, South Carolina uh, said that the underlying premise of the public trust doctrine is that some things are too, too important to society to be owned by one person. And so very broadly under this doctrine, everyone has the uh, inalienable right to breathe clean air, to drink safe water, to fish and to sail, and to recreate on the high seas, territorial seas, and navigable waters. So again, making clear that recreation was part of their uses. Uh, New Jersey, again, uh, said, hey, the public trust doctrine expands to what humans need, and they need recreation. So uh, New Jersey has used its public trust doctrine not only to protect recreation, but also to ensure that the public has access to its beaches, including through the dry sand area above the high tide line that might be a privately owned beach. So uh, again, very broad protection of recreation. All right. That I just my one last point is that New Jersey access right is unusual. Normally, a public trust doctrine right to recreation does not include a path of access to the waterway in question. Uh, you have to find that on your own, either through public lands, uh, for rivers, a lot of time a bridge will serve the purpose. Uh, but you do need that extra access in most states. New Jersey and Hawaii are big exceptions to that. Um, so you don't get access through the land. Again, find a public place of access. Um, and so access to public trust waters, use of the dry sand beach, and use of privately owned beds and banks remain very contentious issues in many states. Uh, including where I was right before California, Utah. This was a highly contentious issue of guaranteeing access to these places of public recreation. So that is how we got recreation into the public trust doctrine. Uh, and I thank everybody for their attention and look forward to the other presentations. So do you all have an order in which you would like the rest of us to proceed? Do you want me to follow up on what Robin was saying since I'm also talking? Yeah, I hope that would be great. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, that was a great presentation on the public trust doctrine uh, and how we got to recreation. I don't think I'm gonna duplicate uh, your work um, or your talk. Um, in some, some areas I might, but mostly I want to talk about um, how the states are responding to their recreational responsibility. So I've been tasked uh, with discussing the public trust doctrine and recreational uses of trust resources. And I'm going to start out by saying, since there's not a lot to say on it, particularly after Rob and Sarah of uh, discussion, I'll be brief um, as I think the lateness of the hour, at least from the East Coast, Coast perspective. Uh, warrants. So based on Robin's thorough review of the doctrine, you should now realize if you didn't already know that the public trust doctrine is a potent property doctrine uh, that is basically rooted in both Roman, oh, sorry, Roman, Roman and English common law uh, to protect public interest uh, in certain uses of navigable waters and the lands underlying them. The doctrine protects these resources in perpetuity and assures free and unimpeded public access under a trust held by the sovereign. 
This obligation places an affirmative duty on state governments and their agencies to protect various public uses of state-owned tidelands and adjacent land, as well as lands underlying those orders. An affirmative duty is an important, I think, aspect um, of, the, of the doctrine. Um, because private ownership can interfere with public access to trust resources, absolute private dominion over property impressed with the public trust doctrine can never be granted unless it is in the public interest to do so. And there is at least one case I can think of uh, where the state courts basically did that. For example, uh, New Jersey, a New Jersey court held under the public trust doctrine Beach user fees cannot limit public access to or use of the ocean and foreshore, nor can they limit the use of the upland sandy beaches for either passage or intermittent recreation connected with the use of the ocean. So the doctrine is not completely water based, it stretches out uh, to the adjacent um, beach area. Washington state courts have upheld the state's Seashore Conservation Area Act, which conferred, conferred on the State Parks and Recreation Commission, the authority to temporarily prohibit vehicular traffic at designated times and places on statutorily created ocean beach highways to protect those resources. In considering whether a use of trust resources will satisfy the state's special obligation to maintain the, the trust for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations, courts must evaluate, and it's quite a list of things, Courts must evaluate the degree of the project's effect on public trust uses. Those would include navigation, fishing, commerce, and we argue recreation. The impact of the individual project um, on, uh, sorry, the impact on, on the individual project on public trust resources, the impact of the individual project when examined cumulatively with existing impediments to the full use of the public trust resources the impact of the project on the public trust resources when the resources is examined in light of the primary purpose for which the resource is suited, such as commerce and navigation, and the degree to which the uh, broad public uses are set aside uh, in favor of a more limited or private one. So it's a fairly detailed uh, examination the court must do uh, when uh, an issue is raised about the application of the public trust doctrine. State courts have vigorously used the doctrine to protect um, communal public resources from inconsistent uses and have strictly scrutinized transfers of public trust resources to non-public parties to ensure that the transfers are in the public interest. Courts never lose their power to revoke a transfer that they later find is not in the public interest. Thus, the practical effect of the public trust doctrine is to convert a private owner of public of trust resources into a mere custodian of those resources. Hence, a lot of controversy about that. Um, such as, um, okay. Um, commerce, sorry, I mean, this, this uh, latent power to jerk away uh, title, uh, as I said, has caused a lot of Controversy. controversy. Commerce, navigation, and commercial fishing are protected uses of trust resources. And the question that Robin was addressing and I'm addressing is to what extent recreational uses, such as non commercial fishing, swimming, boating, sunbathing, et cetera, are established protected uses of trust resources, trumping, and I just get a lot of pleasure now out of using that word again, trumping alternative private uses. Um, the answer is yes, in most cases, in most cases, the state can do this, but surprisingly, recreational resources are not protected in all states. So to elaborate a bit, although the doctrine is grounded in the right, uh, in the right to navigation of trust waters by state citizens and thus has a decided economic purpose, it is expanded over time to protect public rights and rec in the recreational enjoyment of these resources. But the doctrine does not protect all recreational uses of trust waters, and as a state law doctrine will vary from state to state. So you really have to look at each state's uh, doctrine and how it has been developed. So for example, although the Michigan uh, Inland Lakes and Stream Act prohibits construction, filling, or other activities that the Department of Natural Resources determines destroys 
or impairs the public interest in recreation, wildlife, fish, and uh, aesthetics. Recent cases in that state only send the doctrine to fishing because it is, quote, a quiet sport, uh, as opposed to noisy motorboats, I guess, going up and down. So of course it's a, a quiet stort, sport. Um, in another case, the Michigan Environmental, the Michigan Environmental Action Council brought an action under the state's Environmental Policy Act to restrain the state, restrain the state from issuing oil and gas permit drilling permits on trust lands on the grounds that this would adversely affect the national natural resources and the public trust doctrine. The Department of Natural Resources have prepared an environmental impact statement wherein it had concluded that the issuance of permits were not likely to result in the harm alleged. The trial court had deferred to the agency's findings. On appeal, the state Supreme Court held that the trial court had erred by deferring to the agency's conclusions. In the court's view, the statute requires an independent de novo determination by the court once an environmental case has been filed in circuit court. So they couldn't just simply uh, check, check a box. In considering whether dispensation of public trust property is valid by satisfying the state's special obligations to maintain the trust for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations, courts must, one, evaluate the degree of commerce, two, the impact of the individual project on the public trust resource, three, the impact of the individual project when examined cumulatively with existing impediments to full use of the public trust resource, four, the impact of the project on the public trust resource when that resource is examined in light of the primary purpose for which the trust, uh, for, for which the, uh, resources suited, so forth. So we're talking commerce, navigation, and recreation. Um, five, and five, the degree to which the broad public uses are set aside in favor of a more limited or private use. So, uh, so it's a fairly detailed uh, analysis that a court must do. Another relevant case that, that is frequently overlooked on this topic is Mono Lake. Right. Mono Lake is certainly a famous case, but not thought of in terms of recreation. The court in Mono Lake is the National Audubon Society versus Superior Court of Alpine County. The court there held that long-standing long appropriative rights of Los Angeles to withdraw water from non-navigable tributaries of Mono Lake could be reassessed in light of evidence that the water extraction has damaged bird life, diminished the lake size, and increased its salinity. Bird life, recreational recreational uh, use. The Mono Lake decision contains important pronouncement on key features of the public trust doctrine, including the need to protect the area's recreational and ecological values. And I quote from the case, the scenic, case, the scenic view of the lake and its shores, the purity of the air, and the use of the lake for nesting and feeding by birds. Um, that's often, often overlooked in the broader holding. Although states implementing the doctrine doctrine have been described as filling the role of a trustee within the public trust doctrine. The doctrine does not impose obligations on the state like the fiduciary duties that trustees of private trusts owe to trust beneficiaries. Such a broad importation of generalized public trust principles could result in a fundamental restructuring of the public trust doctrine and impose broad new obligations on the state beyond the recognized duty that navigable waters uh, for our navigable waters for navigation, recreation, commerce, and fisheries. I guess that's really all I have to say on the topic, and we'll take questions at the end of the panel. Thank you, Hope. Sarah, do you want to take over? Yes. <laughs> Hi. So wonderful. Wonderful to, to be on this panel with, with Robin and Hope to have the, you know, so much interest in this topic. Um, let me just start, I have some slides, so I'll share them. Alrighty. So, yes. 
there we go. Okay, so I, I'll, I'm just going to talk for um, a few minutes about. Um, and this is kind of the big, the big question of the panel, but I'm going to focus more on Oregon, um, and you know some places where Oregon has really muddled up uh, the public trust doctrine, and in some aspects of the Oregon public trust doctrine um, that are that are robust. And, you know, so you know, kind of starting with. Uh, to say I, I um, was born and, and grew up in Oregon. I went to law school in Oregon, and um, and you know, so when I moved out of state, um, you know, uh, to teach at a law school in New York, these pictures aren't aren't from that. These these pictures are actually so kindly um, provided uh, by um, by Allison Riser. Um, it is, is uh, part of the PowerPoint slides that she provides with her Ocean Coastal textbook. But these pictures, so, you know, the, these no trespassing, no beach access, like, I, you know, as much as so many people throughout the country assume that this is how it is, I being, you know, raised in Oregon, uh, found it shocking that, um, you know, that you could go to a beach, a, a public beach, and it might only be, you know, 60 feet wide. And then you would you would find a you know a fence like like this one here here this just head straight on down to that uh, to the water um, you know and hey everywhere all over the place you know and so then I ask why so controversial right um, these pictures are also provided by Allison Riser right in you know just this this. It's undeveloped, right? Um, coastal marshy land here, um, you know, and then just massive development right to the water's edge. And, you know, really why so controversial in large part uh, because, of, because of development and development dollars and local government reliance on property tax base um, for, to, to fund everything that local governments must do um and on land use exactions and um you know and and other reasons as well of course right so some of the things that i'm going to talk about this slide kind of probably makes me seem more organized than i really am um right but uh you know public access and customary use public access and public trust um and do we even really need to parse them apart or you know should they be under oregon law and then, you know, recreation as a right, since of course that's that's our topic for today. And I don't have it on that last slide, but really also, why does it matter? Um, which which hope already, you know, got to a lot of that, right? So just, you know, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of this of, of Oregon history, right? In Oregon, you know, this reference, you know, uh, kind of the lore of Oregon and the concept of the people's coast, right? So, um, Oregon law stretches, you know, Oregon public trust law and, and uh, stretches back um, before the Thornton versus Hay uh, opinion. Um, but I'm, I'm going to start here and then, and then I'll uh, work my way back. Okay. So Thornton versus Hay uh, was a case re in, with respect to Cannon Beach, which is shown here on the picture behind, uh, behind the words, the text on the slide. And, you know, it was, in this case, um, a private property owner, uh, you know, a commercial owner, um, had attempted to uh, section off and um, use privately and exclusively a portion of the dry sand beach. And the Oregon Supreme Court, it, in looking at the issue, um, said, well, the elements of prescriptive easement are met here, um, but uh, you know, we're not going to resolve the case based on that. We're going to resolve this case based on the doctrine of custom. Um, and in the court stated that the doctrine of custom applies to all the state's speeches and that um, it was satisfied with respect to um, the public use of the dry sand beach. So that excludes that that attempt to, to create an exclusive private area of dry sand beach that the public couldn't um, access uh, was um, you know, was in violation of that. And um, then in 1993, in Stevens versus Cannon Beach, the Oregon Supreme Court was faced with basically the same facts. 
And the interesting thing about this opinion was that this opinion, uh, you know, the court was asked whether or not it, this was, you know, there was an allegation that this was a taking under Lucas, right? Um, a regulatory taking of that private landowner's right to exclusively occupy the private land uh, that was dry sand beach. And the court said no, um, same outcome as Thornton, and no, this isn't a regulatory taking under Lucas because uh, Lucas, you know, has right. Even if even if the the property owner is you know loses um, as a result of the regulation all economic value in their land, which the court didn't have to fully address that question. E even if that happens, you know, the state can rebut that you know showing of a of a per se regulatory taking by showing that a background principle of state law um, prohibited the thing that the regulation prohibits. And so in this case, the court said, it, you know, the background principle of state law here is, um, you know, that all, all read, you know, always, basically always, the public has had this right under Oregon law. Um, and so nothing was taken from this private property owner by enforcing the right. Um, you know, and so, those opinions are, are considered to be resting on the doctrine of custom, and some will debate whether or not the court was, in, you know, relying on public trust doctrine. Um, and I just want to point out that quite quite a few states um, recognize the doctrine of custom as per, as uh, applying to part of um, part or all of the upland beach. Um, but now I want to just kind of dig even more into um, beach access and recreation under the public trust doctrine and come back to that Oregon question. And part of this too is I just like showing really beautiful pictures. Um, so uh, unfortunately you won't get another for a few slides, but um, so in Oregon, uh, you know, and, and I would argue that even under, even in the Thornton and Hayes decisions um, that really the public trust was uh, underlying those decisions, um, you know, the Oregon courts, you know, did not use the terminology public trust for a long time. Um, uh, instead, you know, back in 1859, the Oregon courts acknowledged this, that there was a paramount public right of navigation, fishing, and commerce in all, in, in navigable, in fact, waterways. Um, and I want to point out that that had consistently Oregon uh, recognize this right in navigable, in fact, waterways, not navigable um, under the under the title test. So, um, uh, you know, a, a broader recognition in terms of geographic scope. Um, and in 1918, the Oregon Supreme Court recognized that that these public rights to the to the navigable, in fact, waters included for recreation. Um, and I am going to give you a little bit of the opinion there from that case in a, in a second because I think. It, the, the way that it, the court reasons that it includes recreation is, is um, uh, well, it's remarkable, although I, I, I don't, I wish that it weren't so remarkable. But um, so, so again here, so uh, uh, Oregon also like, like uh, states that Robin mentioned earlier, um, recognize that the doctrine evolves as public uses change over time, right? So, so this is a, a flexible doctrine. Um, but going back to this, you know, recognizing of recreation, the court in um, 1918, this Gilliams versus Beaver Lake Club, I, I don't know how you say it, but, you know, in, back in 1918 said that, you know, even confining the definition of navig, you know, even confining the definition of navigability as many courts do to suitability for purposes of trade and commerce, we fail to see why commerce should not be construed to include the use of boats and vessels for purposes of pleasure. The vessel carrying a load of passengers to a picnic is in law just as much engaged in commerce as the one carrying grain or other merchandise. And the court goes on and talks about the, that right to commerce, including the right to recreation. Um, so I don't know. I, I thought that was would be for anyone who hasn't hasn't seen that. That might be something interesting. Um, so there were great gaps uh, in time when no Oregon court addressed um, public trust or, or um, uh, custom rights. And um, 
In 2005, the Oregon Attorney General issued an opinion that, uh, you know, that, that I believe and, and others um, have, uh, have analyzed and, and argued really uh, confused uh, some of the public trust rights um, and scope of the public trust doctrine in Oregon. Um, right, so, so one thing that the opinion did is it, it, it separated up rights and um, in a way that led to confusion about whether something was, you know, a, a, a customary right or a public trust right, um, when uh, really looking back at, at the Oregon, um, uh, you know, historic uh, court opinions, like similar to the ones I just talked about, showed that, that the public trust right was really very broad set of rights. Um, and this kind of uh, uh, siloing it was further entrenched in, in the Kramer versus City of Lake Oswego opinion, although the Kramer versus City of Lake Oswego opinion also um, did some, you know, did move forward, um, you know, and was pathbreaking in some ways with respect to the public trust doctrine, right? Because for the first time, the, the court in that opinion um, found that the public trust applied to, the, to uplands, uplands. Uh, adjacent to navigable waters necessary for access, um, at least especially with respect to um, you know non-coastal, um, you know that was that was pathbreaking, and also the court clarified in Kramer that the doctrine applied to fish and wildlife um, and to local governments as well as the state. So you know some some clarifications came out of Kramer uh, that were positive, um, but the AG opinion in two thousand five. You know, I I would argue, and and others have uh, have written about this, uh, erroneously limited the geographic scope of the public trust to beds of tidelands and navigable for tidal waters, despite the fact that you know going back, um, you know, by all, you know, a hundred years from that AG opinion, um, Oregon had been recognizing uh, the PTD and navigable, um, in fact, waters. Um, and this, and this delineation, you know, from the Oregon, Oregon AG opinion is further entrenched by uh, Oregon Supreme Court opinion, Turning Act versus Brown in 2020. Um, so, you know, at, at the moment, that's the law uh, in Oregon. Um, and then in 2005, in the 2005 AG opinion, though, the AG recognized that fish and wildlife um, of the state are public trust resources to which the state owes uh, duties and to which the, the public um, has rights. Um, and this was recognized again, as I just mentioned in Kramer, but um, uh, one year later in Turnick versus Brown, um, the court stated to fish and wildlife are not in the public, uh, not in the scope of the public trust. So, you know, murky. Um, so I, you know, Robin already talked about this case um, and I just wanted to bring it back up to this, you know, of course this is in Oregon, but, you know, uh, New Jersey has like you know, a very robust approach to the trust, and um, you know here's some just language from that case recognizing these recreation rights, right? The public's right to swim and bathe, and and the fact that that right depends upon a right to uh, to pass across the upland beach. Um, I'll pause for just a second because there's a lot of words on the slide, and you may want to read them. Right. And, and other states have also used this kind of necessity reasoning to find that there was there is a right to traverse over private um, lands uh, um, to get to that to that public trust um, uh, resource, right? Um, you know, and here's a bit more from that same opinion. Right? The bathers' right in the upland sands is not limited to passage. Right? So here's an example of that robust New Jersey approach. Right? So it's not just to traverse to get to that um, public trust waters. It, it's reasonable enjoyment of the foreshore and the sea cannot be realized unless sun enjoyment of the dry sand is also allowed. Um, just this language, the complete pleasure of swimming must be accompanied by intermittent periods of rest and relaxation beyond the water's edge. You know, I felt that way for sure because I grew up in Oregon. I thought that any other way of thinking just was absurd. 
Um, and you know, I, I, when I was teaching uh, property law to students in Arkansas, uh, I, if I were to explain my that this that this has to be the truth, right? Right? Um, based on my own just personal history, they were like, "Oh, she just hates she just hates private property." Um, <laughs> they would tell me they were like, "You hate private property." I'd be like, "No, I just really feel that there's a balance needed." Um, with respect to public rights and the, and the environment. But okay, none of that. Oh yeah, so here. No, where use of dry sand is essential or reasonably necessary for enjoyment of the ocean, the doctrine warrants the public's use of the upland dry sand area subject to an accommodation of the interests of the owner. But of course, you're also subject to the need for uh, the complete pleasure of swimming and periods of rest and relaxation. Um, you know, so I just ask, right? Is necessity the only reason the public has a right of access to the dry sand area? Um, well, not in Oregon, right? Um, based on the, you know, this uh, this long period of custom and recognition of a, of a public right to the dry sand area that goes beyond just necessity, and also, you know, in other states as well, including, you know, uh, Hawaii and others. Um, I just kind of th this isn't by any means comprehensive, but I just threw together a few little lists. Right, so this you know is the <laughs> you can't really rely on this much because I used an and slash or here, but um, you know so states recognizing a public trust right of access, um, a, a number of them also recognizing a recreation right. Um, you know, and Robin co commented on some of this as well, um, and you know several of course don't and reject that public access. Um, and then and I just point out some states like Connecticut recognize a recreation right, but not a right to traverse private property to access that recreation. And I just wanted to point out a few issues. Like, so why does this matter? Um, you know, well, I guess it matters if you care about that recreation right, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and if, if like the Oregon Supreme Court in the 1800s, you find that recreation is just as legitimate uh, a form of commerce as forms of trade. Um, you know, also if there's a if there's a public access and recreation right, you know, then you know uh, structures, right, hard structures that are damaging uh, to the beach um, or other you know um, land areas adjacent to water. Um, you know, can can find you know they may be in conflict, right, with with the public trust right and the state would have the duty um, to, to intervene. Um, you know, we see like the use of groins and what that does to beach areas. Uh, this beach area right here actually is allowed to migrate. So, um, you know, the, the beach doesn't, doesn't disappear but that wouldn't be the case if it was developed, of course. You'd be seeing something more like what we see over here. Um, so, so that's one issue. But then, you know, there's other issues to consider with respect to recreation. Does a public trust right to recreation create an argument that there's a duty to renourish? Um, I hope not. Uh, you know, and, you know, and I'll just end on, on this kind of out of focus slide that, you know, there, the implications, right, for, for uh, you know, really ecologically sensitive land uh, are great. Uh, I think that the public trust right to recreation could be used to help preserve um, and uh, you know, protect these lands, but but also, you know, when we look at competing public trust rights, and you know, um, the the general view that that they're not prioritized, right? The public trust rights aren't aren't looked at, a, you know, with one being a higher priority than another. Um, I just think it raises some questions uh, that are worth worth talking about or chewing on or whatever. But I'll I'll end it there. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for those great presentations. Um, we will now start the Q and A portion of the panel. So please drop any questions for the panelists into the Q and A function, and I will read those for you. Um, so we have this first one, um, 
if the beach area is shrinking and therefore the public lands are shrinking, could the public gain a right to what is currently private lands? <laughs> oh, oh, that is a thorny question. Um, so basically it's the question of, of does the public have a migrating easement? Um, and, and there are a lot of ways to answer that question. So I'll give you a couple and all of us are laughing for a reason because courts have been wrestling with this one in different ways, depending on how it happens. So the easiest way to answer that question is if the beach is changing um, semi-naturally, now climate change throws a whole wrinkle into what we mean by natural. Uh, but um, if it's happening slowly and gradually and the beach is just migrating one way or another, the basic rule is that the property lines move as well. So um, if um, the, the beach is becoming wider or narrower, uh, it's the, the high tide line in most states is the line between public and private property. A couple of states use the, the low tide line, uh, mostly in the, the Northeast. Um, but it, it, so if it's changing slowly uh, and quote unquote naturally, like I said, climate change throws that, but not through beach renourishment, let's put it that way. Um, then the, the public private line should move with the beach. If it happens suddenly, uh, and Texas has had some really interesting hurricane cases uh, on exactly this issue. If it happens suddenly, the lines stay where they are. And that can go either way. So um, if the, the public part of the beach gets wiped out, the private line stays where it is. But if it goes the other way and the beach is suddenly, you know, 60 feet wider than it used to be, uh, and all of that is below the former high tide line, that's all public. So um, that's a starting answer. And I will emphasize it is just a starting answer to that question. Can I ask Robin, do you think this is gonna be more of a problem in the era of climate change? I'm gonna see more beaches moving thither and yon? I think so, yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, just at sea level rise uh, and the, as Sarah put in her slides, all those walls that are, um, you know, what happens? Well, the water comes in, it's got nowhere to go, the beach can't migrate. So what you get is waves against the wall, uh, which is already happening in a lot of places. Um, and that's one big argument if you're a fan of public rights in the beach to take those walls down because the beach will migrate, uh, particularly in response to most sea level rise uh, and preserve at least some of those public recreation rights, but not if you've got a wall up, uh, you know? And so if the beach disappears, um, you, you, you don't have anything to use for recreation. I, you know, I suppose you can jump off the wall into the water, uh, but maybe not even that if the wall, if the wall is private, uh, privately owned. So um, yeah, it, it, sea level rise and climate change are gonna change that dramatically. Agreed. Thank you, Lisa, for that wonderful question. Next from Charles, uh, could we use the public trust doctrine to access public lands which are blocked off by private land? For example, BLM lands, which are surrounded by private property in states like Montana and Wyoming. <laughs> On what theory? Right, we're talking about a doctrine that is sort of based on water. BLM lands, as you described, are not water-based. So how would you adjust the public trust doctrine to get to these dry land issues? I'm and, at, sorry, sorry, Robin, I was just asking the question. Yeah, and I'll throw in another wrinkle is there's a raging debate about whether the public trust doctrine applies to the federal government at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Mary Wood uh, is very much in favor of it applying to the, the federal government. I'm on record as saying it should as well. 
but uh, we are by no means the Supreme Court and uh, that that issue is far from resolved. So two, two issues going on in that question, uh, public lands, if you don't have the, if you don't have water are not necessarily public trust lands. Um, so I probably not would be my off the cuff answer. Agreed. Yeah, I, I also, you know, obviously I, I agree with that, of course. I would say, you know, not with respect necessarily to public lands except public lands in the coastal zone, states can use the Coastal Zone Management Act to, to, to some extent uh, force the federal government to comply with state public trust as long as it incorporates its public trust into its coastal management plan, into its approved um, coastal management plan. You know, under the under the Coastal Zone Management Act consistency doctrine, um, so there's a there's a leverage point there. Um, you know, to shore it up. In, you know, in the event, the likely event that it, uh, that it continues not to be recognized as applying to the. With that. I looked at that question as well, and whether or not the public trust doctrine can apply to. Uh, deep sea waters, I mean, non-coastal, non-coastal waters and came up with all kinds of, you know, tenuous academic arguments, sure, you can, you can make it, make that argument, but I'm not sure that I would go to court necessarily on it. Um, I mean, the idea is that uh, the doctrine would stretch on an as needed basis to cover lands that are not necessarily or waters that are not necessarily public trust waters, but you're trying to achieve the same objectives to protect the resources itself. So you, you grab the doctrine and say, okay, I'm gonna massage it a bit and try to stretch it. But um, a creative academic moment, <laughs> <laughs> worthless, worthless. And this, this brings to mind a case that, uh, I tried to get a, uh, this guy to make an argument in Stanford. Stanford, Connecticut is, uh, has a lot of land on the Long Island Sound and is beach land. And this kid uh, was jogging on the beach like people jog on the beach and he hit a fence. Somebody had put up a chain link fence which prevented him from going further. So he got pretty hot and bothered about it and posed the question in a letter to the, to the editor. Uh, of, of a newspaper basically saying, wait a minute, I have a right. He didn't, he didn't even have the, the vocabulary of public trust, but I have a right, I know I have a right to move along this beach without any impediment. Um, I, it, I kept her, I intervened needless to say, and I thought, great, you know, let's go to court on this. And he didn't want to go. Um, but I said, I think you've got a really great case. There's a picture of this, of this chain link fence coming down bisecting right the, the, the beach and you you know the kid ran up to the fence and thought it was there and then had to turn around and for years he'd run right through so um, I think those cases are neat cases you just need people who are willing to bring them thank you for that um, for this next question it's kind of a two-parter what are the areas of growth or expansion of the recognition and application of the public trust doctrine presently, other than the atmospheric trust theory uh, slash principle? And can you provide a bit more detail about the doctrine of customary use, thinking of indigenous traditional cultural uses, offres? Notice how we're all leaping into that one. Right, sorry. <laughs> Robin, I was going to say, I've always thought that customary use was a good alternative to the public trust doctrine. If you could establish custom, and that's going to vary, vary state to state, um, it seemed to me to be uh, at some level a more acceptable doctrine to the public, because you were going back to the public and saying, look, you've established this custom, um, and the custom should continue. Public trust doctrine seems to drop out of nowhere uh, and surprise people. So I, yeah, I've been a great advocate of using the doctrine of custom um, to try to you know, protect these resources. Sorry, Robin, you were about to say something. 
Oh, no, I, I, I agree. I, I actually like the doctrine of custom. Um, and in terms of uh, indigenous traditional cultural uses, um, that, that was brought up in, in the Oregon cases as part of the time immemorial sort of use of the beach. Um, and in, in cases where um, indigenous uh, groups in the United States do not have treaty rights to certain areas. So in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of the tribes have treaty rights, which is what they will rely on first uh, to huge swaths of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, uh, if you look at the state of Washington's map of where uh, those, those uh, traditional and customary uh, grounds are, they're, they're the entirety of the coast. Um, but where, where a tribe doesn't have those explicit treaty rights uh, protecting their, their customary hunting and fishing grounds, uh, the doctrine of custom, particularly if the uses have continued uh, into uh, present day, it, it's a great way to set up a huge timeline that benefits both groups, the, the current public and the indigenous group. Um, as, as to the uses that are uh, expanding, um, besides the atmospheric trust uses, my three candidates would be uh, application of the public trust doctrine to water rights, which was uh, the Mono Lake case, National Audubon Society case. Uh, Idaho tried to go there, New Jersey has gone there, Hawaii has gone there. Um, so that's one. Um, application to uh, ecological values using the public trust doctrine to protect um, the ecology of the area is another evolving use. And the third one that I would uh, put in there is the application of the public trust doctrine to modify other kinds of permits. So like Clean Water Act permits. Um, Again, Hawaii and New Jersey have been willing to go there uh, as a limitation on Army Corps permits, for example, or uh, NPDES permits under the Clean Water Act. Um, that's another area outside of the public uh, atmospheric trust. And Robin, what you're talking about is actually amending the permits to include these, these obligations, right? I mean, right. Include a public trust, yeah, agreed. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question from Lisa again, I think this is touching on her first question. Um, if the courts allow the public to have access or a public easement to what was once private lands, would the government have to compensate the private land owners for this quote taking? Background principle of property law, yay. No, I, it, I, that is the normal argument by the states that end up doing that. Um, and they tend to couch it if it's done judicially in terms of this has always been the law in the state uh, and therefore no taking uh, because even under Lucas background principles of property law that limited your private rights cannot be the basis for a taking. So that's the classic argument, uh, however, if you're interested in an interesting dissent, I would turn your attention to the dissent in the State versus McElroy case that I mentioned from Arkansas, uh, because the dissenting ju justice not only accused his colleagues of being communists, uh, but he uh, in 1980 brought up the idea that they had just committed a judicial taking by changing the definition of navigability. So. Um, it, it, it is a felt phenomenon, uh, whether it stands up to an actual takings decision in litigation uh, is a different issue, but certainly the private property owners, uh, uh, you know, uh, as Hope said, public trust doctrine seems to come out of nowhere sometimes for the private property owners who are suddenly told, oh, by the way, the public's already had this right on your property. It, it certainly feels like a taking. Yeah, and I would add, I mean, let's wait and see, but 
we've got, uh, you know, we've got Justice Scalia's law clerk on the court now, who's really enamored of the Scalia approach. And, um, you know, we could be seeing a Supreme Court judicial takings case, right? This idea that judicial recognition of uh, a right, like a, a public trust right, uh, the scope of the public trust, et cetera, can, can affect the taking in, in the way that a, a regulatory taking can affect the take, you know, regulation can affect the taking. So, you know, we could be seeing a lot more um, kind of limitation on, uh, you know, newly recognized or newly, uh, I shouldn't even say newly recognized, but, you know, uh, newly, you know, more recently articulated rights, right, or overruling of, of uh, opinions that had in erroneously constrained the rights, you know, to recognize, you know, what the law was before the opinion. We could see all of those being treated as judicial takings. I don't know if Sarah and Robin will agree with me, but um, as a litigator, I, I stood on my head to avoid uh, raising a public trust issue in, in court. And Lucas was a case where, my God, of course they could have argue, argued public trust, right? It was beachfront property. It was wet. It was like a foot of water uh, over, over the land. And I argued like crazy, please, please do not include that in the argument because I'm deathly afraid that the court could kill the doctrine. It's a, you know, it's a common law doctrine. Um, and common law doctrines don't necessarily fall by the wayside because the state enacts or, or laws enacted as just you know, time <laughs> to, to get rid of it. So um, that's a that's a great, great, another great question. And, and I'll throw in just from the opposite perspective, uh, there are several states that have histories of filling of public trust lands. Uh, Florida is infamous for this, uh, but California had a lot of it too. Uh, before these public trust values were really valued. <laughs> and, and on the other side, these were all illegal grants of public trust lands. Uh, and in most cases, uh, particularly if, it had, if those fillings occurred decades ago, uh, even courts that are strongly in favor of the public trust doctrine in other contexts, like the California Supreme Court, have kind of let the private property rights lie where they were. So uh, San Francisco Airport is built on illegal fill of San Francisco Bay. Uh, and, and the California Supreme Court confronted with the claim that all of that illegal fill that's now been developed in San Francisco is subject to public trust rights kind of said, well, okay, technically, legally, you're right, but we're also living with reality. And no, we're not opening San Francisco airport to the general public. It's not happening. Uh, nor are we ordering it removed. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's just kind of sometimes you do have to deal with reality and let let established private rights uh, that are technically illegal lie where they lie. Yeah, I'm interested in watching the fill of the Hudson River, which yeah. they're doing it with great abandon. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anybody has raised the question about the legality of all of this development, but. I mean, again, throwing your body across that particular highway or track just seems doomed to, doomed to failure. But, but the, uh, on the other hand, you've got this doctrine. If you're not going to use the doctrine, why have the doctrine? So I think there's a tension between trying to protect the doctrine because was it, was it, I always attribute this to Scalia, um, the back and forth and whatever the case was, uh, where, um, Blackman, whoever wanted to make a public trust argument. And Scalia said, if you make that argument, I will drive a stake through the heart of the public trust doctrine. It's done, I'm gonna kill it. And you're thinking, can he do that? Well, you know, maybe he can. <laughs> so that, that nervousness, I think, persists for those of us who've ever been faced with a public trust case. Is this, is this the right case to bring a public trust argument? 
or uh, a wrong case. And, and actually, that, that's one of the advantages of the Supreme Court calling it state law. Yes. Be because if you're litigating in a friendly state court, there's no way to get to the U.S. Supreme Court on a public trust issue. So, um, yep. you know, but what, what the California Supreme Court says about the California public trust doctrine is the end of it. So I don't know, Robin, do you agree if it's a judicial taking, though? Well, um, Fifth Amendment judicial taking. If they, yeah, if they get into the taking argument, um, yeah, you know. But I agree with you about geographics. I mean, to without taking, yeah. Yeah, without the takings issue, you know, you you, you can't put a, a heart a stake through the heart of a doctrine that's a state law doctrine. So, unless you're the state. Just, just, through the state. Yeah. Now, Colorado did a pretty good job of putting a stake through the, the heart of its public trust doctrine. But um, but yeah, it, it, the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, can't quite do that. So the concept of a judicial taking has always intrigued me, sort of how you get there. I mean, I think of takings obviously as being, you know, the executive branch or even the legislative branch doing something, but a court and a decision. Um, I would love to take that apart and see whether there's any there there. Robin, what do you think? And Sarah, do you think there's heft behind this concept of the courts in a, in a court ruling can actually take somebody's property and create a compensation obligation on the court or somebody? I would argue no, if they're interpreting common law. I mean, that's what, that's what judges do. It's what they've always done. And yeah, common law evolves. That's why it's the common law. Um, and I, I think it would destroy the concept of the common law, at least in areas that, that affect property, um, to, to have a judicial taking stocker. I don't know if Scalia would agree with me on that, but... Um, from the grave, from the grave. From the grave, yes. Yeah, I agree, Robin, and I, I think that that's what the what the substantive due process clause is for, like, uh, in part, like, you can make, I, I mean, even there, though, you're not going to base it on the judicial common, and, and no, so I mean, even that's wrong, but, you know, no, I mean, courts have to be free to articulate the law and to correct mistaken prior articulations, and the idea that if it involves the, the a restriction or limiting of private property rights, then all, all those, then we would have this one-sided, you know, um, we would, you know, you would only see uh, common law pronouncements that expand property rights. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, none that protect the, the public side of things. Well, we are about five minutes over time. We still have a few questions, but I will leave it up to the panelists to decide on whether they want to answer those or um, close the panel. As every, everybody had dinner and a glass of wine before this, those of us who haven't, anyway, no, I, whatever the panel wants to do. I'll just say there's a lot of questions about compensation and uh, compensation to the public has never really popped up in, as a public trust doctrine remedy, um, in part because who do you give the compensation to would be an issue. Uh, it's an interesting question, interesting thought, uh, maybe in states where there is a designated public trust agency, which some states do have, that would make sense. Um, but like I said, to the best of my knowledge, compensation has never been raised as a public trust doctrine remedy. Well, thank you to our wonderful panelists and thank you for everyone coming. And I'm gonna close out the panel and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much for inviting us. This has been fun. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you all.